It's really exciting to be here today because I usually get to speak with health professional audiences. And as Sean alluded to, I live and breathe in the healthcare world every day. And over the past four years, I think you could call it disillusionment with the healthcare system because we see a lot of sick people. And the healthcare system perpetuates seeing sick people. If you think about modifiable risk factors for chronic disease, it relates to food and to activity. And frankly, it's from the agri-food sector and the agricultural sector that this interest in food for health has largely been driven. The health sector has been slow to adopt. It's technology intense and it deals in the highest price, the glitziest tools. That's why cardiology is at the top of the heap. We need to shift that focus and it's through this grant that Alma has provided us at the University of Alberta that we've been able to do this. So let me tell you a little bit about Wellness Rx, and I'm going to tell you that we are in early stages. This work represents work that's evolved over the past three to four years, but it's really come to fruition with support from Alma over the past year. As you look at this graphic, this is a day in the life of an individual. It represents what we do every day, what our families do. We get up, we maybe have some coffee, we might watch a bit of TV, we grab our computer, we go to work, we sit down, then we might do some sports, we might try and fit in some food procurement and food prep, and the cycle repeats itself. So let me tell you a little bit about Wellness Rx is, and this is an evolving concept, but it started with the idea that within Alberta, we have the capacity to generate a grassroots strategy facilitating a shift from an illness-based health care system to a wellness-based health system. At the core of this concept is enhancing knowledge and skills of health professionals and the community at large as it relates to food and activity. Once again, at its very core, Wellness Rx, what Alma has funded, relates to an interdisciplinary undergraduate health professional education program in nutrition and activity. So interdisciplinary means that nurses, doctors, pharmacists, rehab therapists, public health uh, trainees, uh, graduates from agricultural life and environmental sciences, physical education, have a toolkit that's consistent. Nurses might need pink font, doctors might need purple font, but we need consistency and common tools with a common, credible language. We talk a little bit about the problem, how we got into this. It relates to the dramatic increase in chronic disease. Uh, as, as Stan Blade was saying at lunch, healthcare in Alberta takes up 40% of our provincial budget. In the audience here, there are people with high blood pressure, diabetes and insulin resistance, high cholesterol, there may be cancer sufferers or cancer survivors. We have families, parents, we have children who might be at risk for overweight and underactivity, and that's what we're dealing with. These individuals might be motivated to, to undertake a change in a health behavior, such as looking at the food they eat, if they present to their doctor and say, I have a headache because my blood pressure is high. So the impact of chronic illness on food choices and activity choices is really important, and we can potentially alter that. Chronic disease impacts whether or not you're going to live, how long you're going to live, if you're going to live long and well and then die fast, which from my perspective would be ideal. The worst thing would be to die really slowly over a long period of time. Impacts quality of life, impacts health care costs. Right now, in Alberta Health Services, in every health care system in North America, doctors and health professionals focus on illness. We see sick people. We don't see the population as a group in whom we can modify health and prevent chronic disease. I think we need to shift the focus. We need to be talking about how through effective dietary strategies and activity strategies, we can modify that risk. And that's the point and purpose of Wellness Rx. We defined the need for Wellness Rx starting in about 2007 when uh, through the Canadian Nutrition Society, we did a national survey of all medical schools and medical student knowledge and comfort with counsel regarding nutrition. When you go into practice, do you think you'll be comfortable talking about diet and chronic disease or diet and acute disease? 
40% of medical students said, well, I think I might be comfortable. That's not adequate. We subsequently came back to the University of Alberta and got a grant through Health Sciences Council to look at all health professionals, recognizing that nurses are often at the interface between the patient, newly diagnosed diabetics, they're doing the teaching, Dietitians are on the pinnacle. They are the key providers of nutrition information. But in Alberta, there's 100,000 healthcare employees and there's about 400 dietitians. As I went around to try and uh, generate interest in this project, often the feedback I got was that dietitians are the food police, whether you're a diabetic or whether you've got chronic renal failure. And in fact, they believe the doctor, which is completely unfortunate and misplaced trust, frankly. So. We found that there is inconsistent knowledge and skills, including counselor behavior and lifestyle modification skills for health professionals across disciplines regarding diet and activity. At the end of the day, it's people, people in this audience, patients, the public who need access to creditable information about food, such as meat and meat products, and health professionals need to be viewed as a source of creditable information. Unfortunately, right now, they are viewed as sources of credible information, but that faith is probably misplaced. So what do we do as a group of professionals? We actually got a working group together from faculty of medicine, nursing, pharmacy, phys ed, uh, rehab, and uh, agriculture, life and environmental sciences, and we worked with Alberta Health Service, Nutrition and Food Services, to form Wellness Rx, which is an undergraduate interdisciplinary educational program. What are our goals in Wellness Rx? Well, I'm just going to back up a little bit. As you can imagine, trying to get curriculum into faculties is really problematic. Faculty of medicine's jammed up, nursing's jammed up, they've got 5,000 students, too much content, not enough time. How do you prioritize this? There used to be nutrition in the Faculty of Nursing. They bailed on it 10 years ago. In medicine, there was one course, and so there's not a lot of place to put in diet and activity strategies. And so we need to be creative with respect to this. So our goal in creating this program called Wellness Rx is to actually create a program of studies that could be a toolkit, that could be integrated vertically, year one to year four, or horizontally, put all these pieces together and come up with a three credit course. Provide learners with knowledge, skills, and attitudes for nutrition and activity. We want to actively engage learners. We don't want to teach them about the Canada Food Guide for Healthy Eating. We know that they get that from K to 12 and they can spout off, yeah, choose five to strive for fruit and vegetables. We also wanted to actually give really practical tools and skills. We wanted to enhance interprofessional function, knowing what the doctor's role is, understanding what the dietitian's role is as the expert in nutrition in the healthcare system. And we actually wanted to have two goals. We wanted to allow learners to improve their own health, their own self-health, as well as the ability to improve the health of their future clients. As you can imagine, when we did our actually first surveys, we asked about macronutrients and micronutrients and chronic disease, but to get <laughs> all these people together, eight faculty members, four different faculties, like I could get an undergrad degree in nutrition, and it still is not enough time. How do you create a toolkit to empower health professionals? We didn't look to doctors and nurses, we looked to educators to help us with curriculum design and development process. And these are stickies, you guys have all been involved in these processes where you put up a bunch of stickies, find out the ones that are the most prominent. And we identified that we actually wanted to focus on concepts that require enduring understanding. Concepts that might be nice to know, concepts that were worth being familiar with, in the context of this whole field of content. As I thought about the Cywin products, my question was, what's the sodium composition of those products? And I've got a fairly focused uh, high skill set. We would want all health professional graduates to say, okay, Cywin, what's the sodium composition in your product? Is that a good product if I've got hypertension? For instance, that would be a really favorable learning response. We developed some guiding principles. We want this toolkit to be transformative. We want this learning toolkit to change how people eat. We want them to reflect on how they eat, what they eat. We want it to be really practical. I come from an Asian background. I have food security issues because I'm a student and I don't have enough money to buy food on a daily basis. I'm a busy mom. I'm trying to sling hash and I like to go out for dinner two times a week. So there's a lot of different aspects of all of our daily lives that impact our food and activity choices. 
It needs to be relevant. It needs to be real world based and problem based. And it has to support the constantly evolving field that reflects this food health paradigm. It needs to be accessible and flexible. This is a lot to ask for in a course that we're trying to jam in. So we've created a toolkit. Once again, we defaulted to our educators from the Faculty of Education and University uh, Learning and Teaching Services. And I'm not sure if any of you have seen the movie, uh, A Life in the Day, where they take snippets, YouTube videos, people submitted them. And it's really engaging. It brings you into the lives of hundreds of people in the day in the life. And we were also informed by this National Geographic uh, Society article uh, or photo series that I use in all my medical school classes. Let me just put these up for you here. This is a week of food from the United States, an American family. You can see the cost of that food for a week is $341.98. You can see that this American family looks pretty darn happy. They got big smiles, they're eating a lot of pizza, they're eating a lot of processed packaged and preserved foods. There's a lot of fructose sweetened beverages there. Those of you in the audience who aren't health professionals can probably fast track 10, 15 years and see the diabetes, insulin resistance, hypertension, early mortality and morbidity related to this sad standard American diet. Just to give you some flavor, this is a, a, a slide from a, a week and a day of the Stroboniski family from Poland where they spend uh, $151 for a week, multi-generational family, grandma, grandpa. You can see lots of fruit and vegetables here, mostly vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, relatively low meat products. If I showed you the slide from Sub-Saharan Africa or the slide from Ecuador, you could understand how food relates to health. These tell powerful stories, so what we wanted to do is get people to tell us their food health stories, get them to describe to us their interest in food, and in doing so, be transformative with our approach to learning. We want to ask people, what is your story? So we're going to use a novel approach with this toolkit that we're using. We're going to jump into 2012 and say to our students, submit your YouTube video. You're a foodie, you like to cook, you like to use pork products, tell us your favorite recipe. Tell us how your father did with his diabetes and what products. So we want to learn from the experience of others and create a narrative database. This narrative database might include issues related to trans fats. It might relate to issues related to health of beef products and its good iron availability, for instance. We want to use a pull technique rather than a push technique, get people to tell us what they're interested in. And we want to be relevant to the student as well as providing them content. In addition to the pat hard content that we get from our food regulators, Health Canada, with the Canada Food Guide for Healthy Eating. This is complex and it's not very evident, but this is the program plan. So in the six months since we've got this grant from Alma, we actually have come up with a program plan bringing all these people together. And we're going to start the first learning unit, which is the most developed, as you can see, with your health. Tell us your food story. Give us your daily intake. What's your daily activity? And, and uh, how are you going to change one or two behaviors? So we're going to integrate behavior modification. In the next series of learning units, we're going to talk about life cycle nutrition and activity. And then we're going to talk about disease. You've got cancer, diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and we'll work with students in a, a process of narrative inquiry uh, and dialogue to help them uh, improve their own health and in doing so the health of their clients. So I've talked about this curriculum development program, but we never began this project without thinking of the other key ingredients for wellness to be successful, to help us effect the shift in from illness system to a health system. So clearly, uh, we've got this program for learning that I've talked to you about, targeted, interdisciplinary, education to practice. I want to complete my health uh, sciences studies and go into practice with this toolkit. And we want to validate that. There's a research component to this. Do students like this? Are they interested in it? Does narrative inquiry work? Can we use this poll strategy? Can we create a library? getting more and more hits, finding out what's of interest, building upon some of the new technologies that people have talked about today. We can ask other important questions. Do nurses need different tools than uh, physicians, than dietitians? Um, can we change personal health behaviors? Can we affect the health of the population? How does this translate to patient-related problems? 
the second ingredient in Wellness Rx, because this needs to live somewhere. If our goal ultimately is to change the health of the population through diet and activity, we need to develop a center for knowledge transfer. And clearly, this is where the course is going to live. Maybe students from McGill would want to take this course. Nothing like this lives anywhere in the world, and there's a huge gap. We want to develop and support a health-focused, wellness-filled community that links education. Post-secondary education in Edmonton is the University of Alberta, and practice is Alberta Health Services. We want to create the place for relevant, timely, creditable nutrition information that might include information that absolutely would include information from Health Canada, uh, Alma, uh, restaurateurs, uh, Alberta Health Services uh, with all their information. And it's going to be used by students, health professionals, and the public at large. And we want to understand how we can support that knowledge user, whether it's the healthcare professional who's at the interface of research, whether it's agricultural, agri-food research, or medical research, and the patient who seeks uh, interventions to support an activity that's going to modify their health. We think that this needs some strategic planning, and we've talked to Ian Graham from CIHR and the Center for Knowledge Transfer, because to develop this, to make it useful and meaningful and effective to support this Alberta community, we need to do it right. In fall of 2012, it's a website that hosts our course, but it needs to be populated. The thing that I'm probably most excited about uh, is the concept that we could create a community movement in Alberta because we've generated capacity and a hunger for credible information and a health professional workforce that's capacitated because we graduate 1,000 health professionals a year from the University of Alberta. With a center for knowledge transfer, we can provide a requisite focus to stimulate a community movement and to effect a paradigm shift from illness to wellness through diet and activity using this uh, core uh, as its center of health professional education. Once again, when I think about food and health, I think about a food health agenda, and I've done some work within the Canadian Nutrition Society, and David McGinnis has participated in some of this work, and I'm interested and keen to hear the developments, but what we want to do is create a pull for high-quality Albertan products that impact health. We want to be able to communicate about the inv innovations in the food sector and support that knowledge exchange to the public in a meaningful and creditable way and ultimately, we want to impact these risk factors for chronic disease. We have a very meaningful partnership with Alberta Health. I'm the medical director for uh, Alberta Health Service Nutrition and Food Service. In Alberta, 108 facilities, food and nutrition service is one. So all the food that patients get, the food and the hospitality, the Starbucks, that's all controlled. And nutrition service is the 500 dietitians that provide standards of practice. If you are a newly diagnosed diabetic, they're the ones who create the creditable information and the carb counting sheets that are actually available only on the intranet, only to dietitians. That needs to live in our center for knowledge transfer, that creditable information so that I have access and the public has access. The other interesting thing to think about is with 100,000 employees and a healthy food policy, there's an opportunity to build upon that. Susan McKay, who's Executive Director and Senior VP of Food and Nutrition Services, is also a big purchaser. 250,000 dozen eggs from an Ontario producer, for instance. They buy their oatmeal from Saskatchewan, but that's a huge food industry within Alberta Health Services to provide for all the patients. I have met with Alberta Health and Wellness, now Alberta Health, uh, and there's an opportunity to potentially link with partners such as Syncrude or Suncor to look at workplace wellness using these tools of diet and activity on continuum. What about the existing workforce? What about the fact that physicians go through postgraduate professional education? Nurses, you finish your degree, you go into practice. Doctors typically undertake anywhere from three to seven years of postgraduate training. As a gastroenterologist, my knowledge, my need for knowledge relative to nutrition is very different than that of a primary care physician who might need to know about infant feeding or obesity or hypertension. So we need to develop that skill amongst existing uh, practitioners. Because you're not from health, what I, I thought I'd just do is give you an idea. Within Alberta Health Services, and uh, Tom Noseworthy as lead with the newly developed strategic clinical networks, are really 
aiming to impact health and measurable markers of success with respect to changing the healthcare system. On a per capita basis, Alberta spends more than any other province. We are not a healthier province. We need to have meaningful payback. There needs to be some investment in health improvement. Out of the five strategic clinical networks that were announced last fall, one of them includes nutrition, diabetes, and obesity. And our playground is big. In nutrition and food service, we spend health promotion, infant school guidelines for diet and activity. We span uh, primary care, primary care networks where people will be seen. We also span tertiary care, critical care nutrition, etc. We provide constant standards and educational tools. So the purview of Alberta Health Service, Nutrition Food Service, is really broad. This is truly a playground in which we can go from research to practice to policy relative to diet and activity, and in doing so, potentially affect meaningful changes on the health system. So what are our next steps? Our program, this is where we're starting, really. We've got lots of big ideas, but where are our feet on the ground? We actually are piloting our first learning unit, you and your health, in the faculties of medicine, nursing and dentistry, and pharmacy this fall. We have two other learning units to develop, so that will be a work in progress. We need to know that the students like it. This is a web-based course. It's easy to use. That's our first level of evaluation, so we're really at the beginning of this journey. So we need to evaluate that learning teaching tool. Teachers need to like it. The profs need to like it. The students need to like it. And then we need to really be more explicit about the educational platform, what goals we can hope to achieve with this. With respect to the Center for Knowledge Transfer, once again, we've developed a website to house the program. But in the larger perspective, we need to define the goals, needs, and opportunities uh, for this Center for Knowledge Transfer for food and health or diet activity and health. We can use this tool to build connectivity all the way from the growers, uh, producers, processors, uh, distributors, to that health interface out to the public in, in meaningful ways. And we need to seek funding to do that. In order to create a community movement, we're actually planning for some st stakeholder engagement and strategic planning this fall. And we want to seek partnerships from both the private sector and the public sector uh, at both a local, provincial, and national levels. So those are our next steps. Wellness RX 2012, we hope, will be a Wellness RX 2017 with meaningful impacts on the health and wellness of our population. Thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions.